would you handle these worst HOA neighbors ever? This post is by Sensitive Ad 1896. I lived in the same HOA off and on in my 20s and early 30s. There were three or four streets and probably no more than about 60 houses in the development. It was a zero lot line community and, of course, the very worst of the worst HOA jerks live right next door. I received handwritten complaints inside my mailbox, illegal by the way, on multiple occasions. The ones I remember were about trash cans left out for too long. I was in major depressive states on those occasions and essentially in order to keep my dog quiet inside my own house when I wasn't even there. They would invite themselves over to my front yard to ambush me while outside with your garage door doesn't need to be up right now or your front shrubs need to be trimmed. This oleander should never have been planted here. On so many of these occasions, I wanted to tell this jerk where he could stick it, but he was a good 30 years older and so ridiculously entitled. I didn't have the guts and it probably wasn't worth it. At some point, my close family member directly across the street started yelling at them as soon as they stepped foot off the road and onto the front of her property. When I left for a few years, the house sat empty while the homeowner, my family member, was in a nursing home and then moved back things had escalated. Before I had left, these jerks had routinely parked a minivan in their driveway. Then their live-in, 30-something year old adult son got a new car and wanted it more protected, so he made some kind of deal with a woman down the street to use her garage since she didn't need the second parking spot. Fine, cool, I don't care. What I did care about was when they started complaining about cars in my driveway. This wasn't something that I did regularly, but my very close friends ended up in a legitimately unsafe situation where they lived and they came to stay with me while they figured out how to get out of their lease and move. The HOA jerk next door neighbors lost it. They tried to throw the bylaw book at me for having cars stored in the driveway. The cars were being used daily and lots of other people parked in their own driveways consistently. At this point, I went through the bylaws with a fine tooth comb. As it turned out, there was a rule explicitly barring one homeowner from using the garage of another homeowner. Why? I don't know or care. Of course, that was a rule that didn't need to be followed, but our driveway had to be clear, shrubs trimmed to their liking, and trash cans brought in before the garbage truck was off the street. There were a couple short cul-de-sacs in the neighborhood that ran right up to a ravine so there was no house at the end of these streets. Apparently, these jerks didn't like that a homeowner parked his work supplied and branded truck on the street at the end of his cul-de-sac. Their first call to complain wasn't to him, wasn't to the HOA, it was to his employer that supplied the truck. These people were ruthless and garbage humans. These are the same neighbors that complained that I didn't pick up my dog's poo in my own front yard. We didn't have any backyards at all and almost no one had grass in their small side courtyards. They were upset that my 10 pound dog who runs straight out to pee and straight back wasn't on a leash because their dog was aggressive and pulling out at the same time. Because clearly my dog being on a leash would totally fix that. Once we got a third car and parked it routinely in the driveway, they all completely lost their minds, knocking at all hours to complain while I worked enterprise sales at home, literally peeking over their courtyard wall into my kitchen, making nasty comments to my boss about me, who they went to church with, and calling my parents and other family to complain about me. These same people caused other residents to walk a certain route to avoid going past the jerk's house. It was a quiet neighborhood, so anytime someone had a party, there was a noise complaint and lots of spying on what exactly was occurring, followed by more complaints more often than not. They convinced the HOA that we shouldn't be allowed to attend HOA meetings or use the pool because our names weren't on the deed. This even though we paid all the bills, the taxes, and the HOA fees directly. Eventually, they let me in the meetings, but tried to tell me that I couldn't speak. That didn't last long. And then they tried to not allow me to vote until my father showed up to a meeting to remind them that he owned two properties in the neighborhood by proxy and power of attorney. My final straws 
or when they had their roof replaced and their roofers entered my courtyard unannounced, seeing me partially clothed in my own kitchen and then trampling my landscaping every day for a week. After that one, I was throwing roofing nails back over their wall and onto their driveway for months. They officially complained to the HOA about a small tree that wasn't trimmed to their liking, so I brought up their son's car in the neighbor's garage, and the woman who owned the said garage ended up throwing a tantrum completely with fake tears in my living room, because apparently he was paying her and she needed that income. However, it was particularly satisfying when my partner told the next door neighbor that he didn't like the highly pruned style of their front yard and preferred our slightly more wild look. I swear, that man turned as bright red as a fire truck. Almost as red as when we pointed out that the neighborhood really wasn't that nice due to the enormous metal electric towers running down the middle of our street. There were islands in the road to accommodate these huge things that you could hear buzzing even from inside 24-7. About six months before we bought our house and got the heck out of there, I was walking my dog on a leash and she peed in another neighbor's yard on the way by. We turned to continue and I heard a voice say, clean up after the dog. Well, I turned around and there was no one there. This woman was yelling at me through her doorbell about non-existent dog poop. I am not proud to say that I saw red and proceeded to read her the riot act into her doorbell and pressing it repeatedly, telling her to come out. She never said another thing, never came out, and I never did see the woman ever. I never did bring up that my awful neighbors had at least two businesses running out of their house, strictly forbade in the bylaws, literally broke into the irrigation system controls to water their yard more on the HOA's dime, or that they had a visible water spigot and hose in their front yard. It just wasn't worth it. Perhaps this was more of a post about bad neighbors, but I will never, ever, as long as I live, own or live in an HOA again. My family is fully out of there now, and no one has anything nice to say about the place. Do you agree with these commenters? On in order to keep the dog quiet inside the own house, commenter says, I didn't need to read past this. How dare someone expect peace in their own home? OP says, Ha, huh, you come to my door and tell me that a 10 pound dog behind the brick walls of my house is disturbing you from inside your bricked house and I'm gonna laugh while I slam the door in your face. Comment says, can we not compare everyone we don't like to that group? That's super messed up and insensitive. Frankly, you both sound insufferable. What'd you think of this story? HOA Karen finds me for building on my property. I'm not even in the HOA. So I live in a nice suburban town and all my neighbors are great, except this evil rat HOA Karen. I got into a nasty argument with none other than that notorious HOA Karen, a woman with a scummy desire for meddling in other people's affairs. While she has her own behind her husband's back, it's like everybody knows but him or he just doesn't care. The trouble began when I built a brand new shed over in my backyard, probably violating every freaking HOA rule known to man, but to be honest, I didn't give two cares. You see though, there's a big problem. I was not part of this money hungry, grubby greedy HOA. So I scratched my head, wondering how Karen, everyone's favorite snake, had found her way into my life. Ask and you shall receive. Armed with a camera and a clipboard, she approached me with the confidence of a seasoned drill sergeant. Excuse me, dear, she declared, but your shed violates several HOA guidelines. I suggest you rectify the situation immediately. I'm fining you for your violations. I chuckled, a mix of disbelief and irritation brewing within me. Karen, I'm not in the HOA. This is my property and I'll put up whatever shed I darn well please. Her eyes widened in horror, the revelation hitting her like a rogue wave. A flicker of realization crossed her face, quickly replaced by the familiar scowl that earned her the infamous title of HOA Karen. I don't care if you're in the HOA or not, she retorted with an air of superiority. I have a duty to protect property values and that shed is very ugly. I refused to give in to her idiotic demands and I stood my ground. Karen, however, was relentless. She bombarded me with violation notices, each one even more ridiculous than the last. Shade of paint too bold, lawn too tall, mailbox color disallowed. 
It's as if she just had this uncanny ability to detect any deviation from her narrow definition of a town's perfection, and she wrote out fines like a shady doctor writing prescriptions. Frustration led me to consult a lawyer, and armed with legal advice, I embarked on a journey to put an end to Karen's tyranny. The courtroom became our fighting grounds, and Karen, now appropriately dubbed HOA Karen in my iPhone contacts, showed no signs of backing down. Wearing her ugly signature oversized sunglasses, she portrayed herself as a defender of the neighborhood's sacred aesthetic. <laughs> the legal proceedings were a roller coaster of insanity. Karen insisted that my shed cast a huge shadow on her yard and disrupted her. I could hardly believe the drama queen that she was. Yet, despite that absurdity, justice prevailed. The judge, perhaps sick and tired of Karen's whining and overbearing nature, ruled in my favor. The shed was deemed well within my property rights, and Karen was ordered to cease her meddling. As the gavel struck, a triumphant smile spread across my face. Victory was sweet, but the real satisfaction came from knowing that Karen's reign of HOA terror had come to an end. Enough of that crap, am I right? I am wondering how you can force HOA rules on somebody that's not in the HOA, unless she's just trying to have this tough persona and then you call her bluff out and then everything falls apart in this house of cards that Karen tried to build. Cheap old crappy cards. You'll love this HOA story, the OP's writing style is just funny. It's called Wanna Ruin Kids Fun Time? Okay, good luck using that luxury car. Post to buy Jiggle Bounce. A little background. My friend lives in a gated community. He is on the HOA board since he is in construction and handles the community's needs if needed. The houses there range from comfy, read middle class, to I crap money, read they crap money. I am talking see-through infinity pools that you can see butts at eye level, fully equipped four or five car garages, a two bed space for the maid, and of course, seating areas suspiciously convenient for doing illegal substances. These houses are usually located by themselves, no neighbors at a cul-de-sac. This means the road is usually free of traffic and pretty safe for children to play, which is exactly what kids did once summer or any other holiday came along. They would ride bikes, they would race, and they'd do other kids' stuff. The couple lived at one of these houses. Let's call them Mr. cul de Nutsack Karen and Mrs. cul de Nutsucker Karen. They were grade A muffins. They would throw parties every weekend. It almost always resulted in crap being thrown on the street, burnt rubber from cars smoking their tires, and so on. The HOA cited them many a times, but they would just pay the fines and carry on. Mr. and Mrs. Karen never liked kids playing in front of his house. No idea why. It's not like they could just hear the kids since the front lawn was pretty expansive and they had a gate. So Mr. and Mrs. Karen would whine over to the HOA, citing kids safety, and my friend would go and talk to them. Keep in mind that my friend is a homeowner too, and it would go something like this. Hey, friend says, I'm here to talk to you about the complaint. Mr. Karen, uh, yes, when's the dang HOA going to take care of it? I actually want to discuss the issue and maybe we can find another solution. Just do it, okay? Uh, but we cannot ask parents to stop their kids from playing, and we can't stop kids from playing on this street, since it is the safest area that they can play in while being close to their own houses. It's not safe for them to be playing out there. What if I hit a kid? I don't want the liability, so just uh, take care of it, okay? The friend is silent. Think of it as, uh, as kids' safety. I, I, I am sorry, we just cannot do it. Even if we did, we can't enforce it. I will be speaking to the HOA's president. Friend says goodbye and leaves. They would calm down for a few weeks and then whine and complain again. Nothing would change their mind about complaining and demanding that the kids be banned from playing. Finally, after a year of this, the HOA caved and decided to put out a rule that kids are not supposed to ride bikes on the roads for safety reasons. Enter my friend, let's call him F, and his malicious compliance. F knew Mr. Karen had an expensive car that he loved to show off. This car rode really low, think like three or four inches, probably measured it with his Johnson, F convinced the HOA that the rule would never stick and the only option was to install some speed humps, which are speed breakers, speed cushions, traffic common devices, slow your old broski devices, on the left and right sides of the cul-de-sac part where Mr. Karen's gate started. 
The maximum allowed speed hump height by law is four inches, not verified, and guess which ones F decided to install. The HOA still received complaints from the Mr. Karen, only now the complaints are about the speed humps catching the bottom of his favorite car. He wants them removed and says that it's damaging his cars and the cars of people who drive to his house for the weekend parties. The HOA responds and says, we cannot do it in the interest of kids' safety. Reed, think of it as kids' safety, jerk. He had to drive his low-riding cars diagonally. Kids still played between the speed humps, using them as boundaries for their games. One of the people who help run my HOA gets mad every time my manager comes to my house because he drives a late 90s Toyota Corolla. She says his car is too low class for our middle class neighborhood, posted by Emancipated Tree Snake. Every few weekends, my manager comes over my house to help work on a side project for the company. When he comes over, he parks in front of my house. The house across from mine just so happens to be one of the worst Karens or HOA volunteers I've ever met. She tends to take her job a bit too seriously. Anyways, she complains to my wife and I every time she sees the car like clockwork. She will either call or wait until she sees us outside. The first time, she even took it upon herself to write a letter about how it's better for everyone if we can keep up a certain image in the neighborhood. I explained to her that he is my manager after the letter about a year ago. She accused me of lying since I drive a nice truck and have a nice house, so she knows I bring in a decent salary. She assumed that my manager made more and therefore he needs to own a nice car. I then explain that my manager makes $250,000 a year and he drives a beater because he does not care about his image. She then goes on some rant about how she goes into massive debt just to keep up the right image for the neighborhood and that it's ignorant of my manager to save his money and buy a beater when people like her are paycheck to paycheck to keep up with the Joneses. Lucky for me, I cannot get fined, but I still find it quite annoying that she is worried about the cars that my guests drive. I told my manager about her constant complaining every time he's over. He joked that he will spray paint his car with chalk next time that he comes over to make it look as trashy as possible. I told him to dress in the worst clothes as well and slowly get out of his car to make sure she notices. People who actually have money don't usually feel the need to make sure everyone knows they have it. Do you agree with this comment? Neighbor uses side entrance, which opens to our yard, for the landscaper to cut their grass. Hi, not sure if this is the right subreddit. My husband and I just bought a house in an HOA gated community with about 60 single family homes sitting on about 0.15 acres each. The HOA was formed in around 2019, but they've only just started to enforce rules. We have this rule that fences need to be set off two feet from the property line. Our neighbors to the left have a fence that is set off one foot from the property line. They've been grandfathered in, but they have a side gate that opens inward to their property. The previous owners of our home didn't have any landscaping, so the communal landscaper would mow our lawn and then use our lawn to enter the neighbor's lawn through the side gate. We decided to plant some trees to mark our property line. We made sure to leave a gap in the trees for the gate, though my neighbor had said it's defunct and doesn't really open. Now that we have trees lining our property, since we didn't want to build a fence because it was going to have to be two foot set back, which seemed kind of silly, we mulched them. But now, the landscaper is saying it's too much of a pain to weed whack around them, so he would prefer one solid bed. Okay, we will do a solid, but we want to put edging in. Our neighbor saw my husband put edging in, which, by the way, is not easy considering we're in South Carolina and there's tough clay soil. She politely said, Please make sure to not edge by where the gate is so the landscaper can ride in on his mower. Are we right to be annoyed that we have to adjust our landscaping in order to accommodate the mower? Should we talk to the ARB, the board? We want to be good neighbors and we also want our property to look good. Any advice is greatly appreciated. An answer. Do you have a copy of the community rules? Where I live, we have a specific rule telling residents they cannot add or do things to impede the landscapers. Do you have an architecture committee? Have you talked to your management company? And OP replies, We don't have a management company. We have volunteers that make up each committee and the board. I don't think I have the latest copy of the community rules because they haven't been approved yet. It's so lackadaisical here. But the ARB said nothing about mulching and edging. 
that's just been our landscapers' comments. It sucks that we have to sacrifice our landscaping in order to help our neighbor have a rotting mower get in there. Wondering if the landscaper can use a smaller mower specifically for their plot. Now you could definitely raise the question and concern here, just be very careful when you do, OP, if you decide to. Sue the HOA president for putting a lien on my house. I can't believe my stupid HOA president did this. So there I was, minding my own business in my man cave. Little did I know, that quaint dwelling would soon become ground zero for a showdown with the infamous HOA president. Now, let me be clear, I never signed up for the neighborhood drama, but life has a funny way of throwing curveballs when you least expect it, and sometimes those dang curveballs hit hard. So yeah, it all started innocently enough. One sunny afternoon, I got a letter in the mail. Dear resident, it began ominously enough. As it turns out, our friendly HOA president had decided to slap a lien on my house. Can you believe it? The nerve of some people. I mean, sure, I might have left my trash can out an extra day or two, but a lien? Really? I was ticked. I decided it was time to put on my metaphorical cape and dive head first into this rabbit hole that is those legal proceedings. Cue the dramatic courtroom scenes. Well, maybe not that dramatic, but you never know, right? So there I was, regular old Joe, thumbing through crappy legal jargon and trying to decipher the intricacies of the legal system. It felt like navigating a maze blindfolded, but I was determined. With the help of a sharp-witted lawyer, we discovered that our HOA president had overstepped his boundaries, big time. The lien, it turned out, was as illegal as child beauty pageants should be. The courtroom battle that ensued was like something out of a legal thriller or like Law and Order, complete with a strong argument and an angry judge. I fought tooth and nail, gave it everything that I had, armed with the knowledge that justice was on my side. As the case unfolded, it became clear that our dear HOA president had not only misinterpreted the rules, but had also taken some, uh, creative liberties in his pursuit of order. The judge, with a raised eyebrow that spoke volumes, ruled in my favor. But, here's the twist. Justice, it wasn't enough for me. I wanted more than just a legal win. I wanted that justice. So I dug a little deeper into the affairs of our once mighty HOA president. <laughs> Lo and behold, I unearthed a hidden gem. Turns out, he had committed a few screw-ups of his own, bending the very rules that he claimed to uphold. What a hypocrite. So I was armed with this juicy information, and I decided to play my trump card. A countersuit was in order, and this time the stakes were higher than ever. As the legal battle waged on, the neighborhood buzzed with speculation. It was as if our little community had become the backdrop for a legal soap opera. And guess what? I wasn't complaining. I wanted this dude to pay for the crap that he pulled on me. In a surprising twist of fate, the tables turned and Mr. HOA found himself on the receiving end of a legal thrashing. The judge, with a stern gaze and a nod of disapproval, declared his actions as egregious as could be and completely out of order. With the hefty settlement awarded to me and a messed up reputation for our former HOA president, justice was finally served. He even had to sell his house and say bye bye to our little neighborhood. Ha, <laughs> sayonara sucker. It's a classic case of, I have the power, I'm going to put it on you and hope you back down. But you see, here's the thing, when somebody knows that, that crap is being pulled on them, wool over their eyes, they actually stand up for it, a lot of things can happen, at least in this case. What would have you done? HOA Karen gets sweet, instant karma for messing with the tree that isn't hers, posted by Noise Hens. So some brief backstory is necessary to understand the direness of Karen's situation. Karen, along with her daughter, owns a house in a street along with seven other people, including me. This street is somewhat private, although it isn't gated, it shares many resources and services that sets it apart from the rest of the community. Basically, it was originally empty land in the middle of an already existing neighborhood bought privately by a group who built houses and sold them. For these reasons, this street has an HOA representative, homeowners association, and they share things like lawn maintenance and street repair cost. For example, the street splits the cost for repairing stuff like the street lights and the people that mow the lawns do the entire street at a time. Karen and her daughter are rarely seen in this small street and they instead rent their house out to newcomers every few months or so. I have only seen them in person a few times since I moved here. 
On their most recent return a few days ago, they decided to have the tree out in their front yard trimmed down before the next tenant arrives. Unfortunately, this tree belongs to the street, and she has no jurisdiction tampering with it, and she knows it. She made a halfway attempt to call the HOA board, and then when they did not reply right away, she took the initiative to cut the tree to her desires. This morning, a group of workers came in a truck and loud power tools to cut off several branches from this large tree. The Indian dude came out first to complain, and later came the old lady. They've both been living here for a long time, and they understand the rules clearly. The conversation was distant from my house, especially since I chose not to go outside and join the argument, but it went along the lines of the following. Hey, you can't cut that tree, Indian guy says. Karen says, well, it's on my property. Actually, it's not. Tell them to stop cutting it. You need to contact the HOA first. I did, and they didn't respond, so it's not a big deal if I just trim it, okay? Old lady chimes in, any change affects the value of the entire street and every house on it. You have to stop it. Oh my goodness, it's just a tree. Just give me a break, okay? For those that don't understand, the entire street sort of has a common theme to it where every house has a similar design and each having a tree is part of said design. Stripping this mature tree down to a couple of branches completely ruins the look of the street. Indian dude walks up to the workers who are basically already finished and says, Guys, please just stop for now. Karen steps in front of him. Hey, back off. He puts his hand on her shoulder to push her away and she says, Stop being aggressive. It goes on for about 30 minutes, the entire time Karen is being extremely rude, interrupting people and basically whining incessantly. Indian dude, old lady and the other neighbors watching knew that they couldn't do anything without contacting the HOA first. They certainly didn't want to touch her and they couldn't do anything with the workers because they were hired by Karen. This entire time her daughter didn't say anything and stood at the doorway of her house. The workers continue with the tree and in no time it was finished. About an hour passes when Indian dude and old lady return with news from the HOA. It was true that Karen couldn't touch the tree, and everyone knew that. But what Karen didn't know was that the consequences were extremely straightforward and relentless. When they began to explain to Karen her remaining options, she had a witchy smirk of victory on her face, but it didn't take long for it to be completely wiped away. HOA policies dictate that she has to completely replace the tree, which means that she needs to hire people to come dig the tree out, pay for a new tree, pay for it to be planted, and pay for the lawn that will be inevitably torn up as the tree is being replaced. If she does not comply, her house will be put on lien and be no longer considered an extension of our private street. For those that aren't fluent in real estate terms like me, this means that Karen cannot sell, rent, or refinance her property until said conditions are met. Even if she complies right away, her new tenant will be delayed at least a week or more while the tree is being dug up. This is just such a sweet and fitting end to her entitled attitude. In total, she'll be set back thousands of dollars for essentially nothing except lacking consideration of those around her. I'm not entirely clear on the cost, but I expect it to be at least 10 grand. Moral of the story, don't screw around with trees. They have countless lawsuit and HOA strings attached to them. And don't be a jerk to your neighbors. Now to explain why Karen deserves her justice, I forgot to mention that she did flip everyone off and threaten to call a lawyer. She acted really childish overall and kept repeating the same phrase, something like, you can't touch me, I did nothing wrong, over and over while interrupting people. Her daughter wasn't too much better, but you can't really blame her for trying to defend her mother a little bit. She probably just didn't understand what her mother really did. Her daughter was like, stop shouting, don't get aggressive, and so on. After talking with some of my neighbors, it turns out that Karen was a bee long before I moved here. A long time ago, there was a rule that you couldn't park your car on your driveway, which most people thought was stupid. I think it's stupid too. The rule was set when the street was built because people wanted it to look nice or something. Apparently, Karen took this rule way too seriously and kept on giving tickets to the old lady's husband. I mean, come on. What a way to get to know your next door neighbor. Before long, the entire street voted the law out 7 to 1. Guess who wanted to keep it? Karen also locked the back gate of the street closed and didn't give the key to anyone because she thought she was entitled to control who gets to use the community gate. 
Too bad I wasn't there at the argument because I could have transcripted more of what they said. Karen kept on trying to change the subject and put blame on the old lady for letting her bamboo fall into her backyard. Come on, old lady was sick that day, so what a butt move for arguing with a sick old lady. I'd also like to mention the trees, yes trees, I realized after looking closer at her yard that she cut were two cypress trees and a deciduous tree that grows red seeds in hard pots that I forgot the name of. The cypress trees she cut were towering and magnificent. She trimmed them down halfway and they will never regrow because both trees are at least 20 years old. This story is called, If I already live in a neighborhood and the HOA tries to claim it, am I forced to join the HOA? When my sister bought her house, she was the third person to buy in the new neighborhood. They signed the papers and started making payments before the HOA was established, so the HOA was not mentioned in the paperwork. Over the next few years, my sister and her then-husband erected a basketball goal, added a covered patio, an in-ground pool, and a large storage and workshop. They bought one of the two lots on the very tail end of the cul-de-sac, so their lot was huge. They still had way more backyard than most people. They took very good care of their home and yard and so on. The shop was painted to match the house and the basketball goal was kept in tip-top shape. Enter the new HOA. My sister declined to join it and they decided to ignore her letter of refusal and started sending her violation letters for the shop, the basketball goal or hoop, the patio, the paint scheme, right down to the dogs they had. Three is permitted by the city and we have no breed restrictions. My sister returned all the letters with a copy of the refusal to join letter along with a copy of the registered mail receipt showing they received it. They started fining her. She kept doing what she was doing and pulled in an attorney friend who was more than happy to take over. The HOA finally took her to court. Her lawyer countersuit presented all the paperwork to the judge and the judge not only found in my sister's favor but the HOA had to pay all of her attorney fees and had to reimburse her for all the postage fees that she paid responding to the letters. She always sent them registered mail. The judge was incensed by the matter, especially when he saw her original letter declining the request that she join the HOA. Do you know that they kept trying to fine her? She sent them copies of the original ruling and they again ended up in front of a judge. That judge ruled the same as the first one. The third time, the judge yelled at the president of the HOA, the attorneys, and told them if they didn't leave my sister alone, he'd cite them for harassment. My sister's attorney said if they continued, she could sue the HOA president, all of the officers, along with the attorneys, both professionally and personally for harassment. The HOA left her alone after that. She has had to run off some of the HOA snoops that she's caught peeking over her privacy fence trying to see what's in her backyard and ended up slapping a restraining order on them. The HOA had to reimburse her for that too. I, for the life of me, don't understand why people would spend their hard-earned money for a home and a lot they don't have control over. No way would I ever live in an HOA-controlled community. Do you agree with this commenter? Let's see. HOAs are effectively microcosmic fascism. They say you own the property, but then tell you what you can and can't do with your property while charging you a tax or HOA fee for the privilege. About the only thing they don't do is have you and your family killed if you disagree, but even that happens sometimes. The world has enough layers of government with narcissistic dictators running them, so why subject yourself to another? If you don't like HOAs, don't buy into HOAs, and if you're already in one, abolish it. But if people are stupid enough to live under the tyranny of one, too bad, suckers. I gotta know what you think about that one. Shame the HOA into disbanding by deleted. My mom lives in a nice newer home community with a voluntary HOA. My mother being the firecracker she is, she refused to formally join the HOA, but agreed to do the things that she would do anyway to upkeep her home. We paint for her, she has a gardener, she washes windows, and so on. She never signed any documents, doesn't pay fees, but told the board that she would adhere to the standards that she didn't find silly. The volunteer president lives next to my mother, and this guy has never liked our family. Since mom didn't join, he would knock on her door for friendly visits to tell her what rules she was violating. It was all very silly and we continued to ignore him. His biggest pet peeve was her trash cans. Apparently, they stayed out too long after trash pickup and he said it was an eyesore for the rest of the neighborhood. Now I have to explain a few things about mom. My mom is a double amputee 
has the dysfunctional side from a stroke, is wheelchair bound, and is still about 95% independent. There are a few things that she can't do, and bringing in the trash cans in and out of the side gate is one of them. For that chore, my sister or I come over the night before trash day and put them out and the following evening to put them back in. He whined and complained, wrote letters and called the city about her trash cans. This guy knew my mom was in a wheelchair, but he kept harassing her. It was after a winter storm that the trash can blew over and sprayed the neighborhood with trash overnight. It wasn't just her can, by the way, it was several. My sister and I walked the neighborhood and we picked up the trash as soon as we could. Well, the president lost his mind. And this time, he went too far. He gathered up the other members of the board next trash day and stormed up to her house. He yelled at her through the screen door while the other sycophants nodded their heads. I happened to be there and I was preparing to grab a broom and go after them. But to my mother's credit, she didn't yell back. She simply opened the door and rolled her wheelchair down the drive. And then, my tiny mother struggled to pull the trash can back up the driveway with her one good arm. It was actually pretty sad. Mom hammed it up. She is adapted to her weak side, but you wouldn't know it from watching her that day. By the time she got the can halfway up the drive, the angry mob was glaring daggers at the president. I would find out later that he never told them that she was disabled. He also painted her as lazy, and most of the meetings were the president complaining about my mom and telling lies about what a nightmare it was living next to her. After a round of muttered apologies, they scattered like roaches in the light. Once they left, I moved the trash cans in and we had a good laugh. The volunteer HOA ended soon after that. Apparently, no one wanted to attend meetings that were little more than glorified wine sessions about my mom and the other people in the neighborhood. The president had been harassing other homeowners and telling similar lies about them. He was proven a liar and we almost never see him now. I'd say the neighborhood has gotten better at this point. This guy turned out to be the cause of all the strife, and without his influence, people began to actually talk to each other. Nowadays, people stop by to check on mom during storms, and sometimes her trash cans will magically appear in the side yard on windy days. And mom, in perfect fashion, sent out Christmas cards to all her neighbors. You may have seen this card in the stores, but it has a raccoon on it and says, Merry Trashmas. Oh, I'm on private property? Posted by one cardiologist 462. I used to work for a supermarket chain and quite often, I'd be asked by management to work at other locations. Most of the time, this wasn't a big deal. I was happy to help out. It gave me an excuse to drive and have the petrol paid for. However, one day, I was asked to work at a location very far away at a very early hour of the morning. I initially refused on the grounds that I would have to wake up at around 2 a.m. in order to have a shower, breakfast, and drive to be on the site for 5 a.m. After some arm bending from management, I finally relented and begrudgingly agreed that I would do it. Due to the drive not taking nearly as long as I initially expected, I arrived on location at about 4.30 a.m. I waited in my car with the music playing, and at 4.50 a.m. I get a loud knock on the car window, nearly making me jump out of my skin. It was the manager for that store, who, never seeing me before, did not know who I was. The conversation went as follows. You need to leave. This is private property. Oh, but I don't care. Go now. Me, quickly realizing I can play this to my advantage. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, sir. I don't want any problems. Of course, I'll go right away. I'm sorry. And as per his care and request, I drove home with a smile on my face, knowing that I have the rest of the day free to myself. A few hours later, I get a phone call. I answer the unrecognized number, and I recognize the voice immediately. It was the care and manager who told me to leave. Uh, hello, I'm looking for Austin. Ah, uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, this is Mr. Karen calling from this location. I was expecting you to work here with me today. You should have been here for 5 a.m. Me, trying to sound casual. Yeah, I was there waiting in my car. You told me to leave, remember? Uh, but you didn't say that. I interrupt him. There are no ifs or buts. I was on private property and I was asked to leave. I was legally obligated to do so. 
Uh, right, but don't you think it doesn't matter what I thought? I was asked to leave private property. I'm not going to break the law and risk getting in trouble with the police. It was at this point he hung up on me. I expected to get in trouble for what had happened, but I never heard anything more about it. More info from OP. I was paid for the gas money and the travel time, but I was not paid for the shift. It was originally going to be a day off anyway. I suffered no financial losses whatsoever as a result of this, and my local manager never spoke about it, and I never mentioned it to him. I did not suffer any disciplinary action. Yes, I did have to wake up early and lose out on sleep. OP, this is such a perfect example of ask before you make assumptions. You know what assuming makes? Assuming makes a what out of you and me? I just love to reference that. Neighbors in a homeowners association have issues that I don't follow the HOA rules. Alternate Chaos 5150 post. So the neighbors called me a butt today. I bought a house five years ago that a real estate company built on speculation. Mine was the first house in a planned subdivision that they were going to build one house at a time or as people bought the individual tracts of land. The area kind of hit a boom period and the other surrounding houses went up quick. In my contract to purchase my home, there was no homeowners association and because I was here first, I don't have to join any if the other neighbors decide to create. I'm grandfathered in is what it says in my contract. They all seem to forget this though, and they continually try to give me HOA fines for breaking the rules of the HOA. This has ranged from days that I have things delivered to my home, like Amazon deliveries on Sundays, to when I cut my grass, to me having vehicles parked in my yard and they aren't happy that I own an extra tract of land because I bought two to have a bigger yard so that I could build a shooting range. I live in the south, this is not that uncommon. The recent event though that led them to call me a butt is that they came over to ask me to remove the eyesore in front of my garage. Now, my home faces the road, not anyone else's house, so they don't stare at my garage, but apparently they still don't like it. I run a small hobby business of doing woodworking projects and I have a shelf outside my garage door full of various pieces of treated lumber that I may use one day. It's not the neatest in the cleanest area, but it's not a disheveled mess either. So I told them if they lightened up and just left me alone about all the other stuff, I'd consider moving my wood pile if it bothered them so much. They proceeded to tell me that I needed to address all the HOA issues and take care of the wood pile, along with stopping any deliveries on Sundays and getting my other truck out of my yard. They handed me what basically amounts to a ticket and I trashed it and I told them to get the heck off my property. They called me a butt for my unreasonable behavior and told me they'd be back. I've been in contact with a real estate attorney about the deed and whether or not they can still attempt to legally force anything. Also, I've contacted one on creating a cease and desist. I do have cameras on my property. The vehicle in the yard is just one and it's not an abandoned wreck. It's a fairly new truck that I use mostly on weekends. It sets there so I can get my other vehicles out easier. I do move it when I mow, so it's just sitting there beside my driveway. Do you agree with this comment? Not the butt. Is there any way to get a sort of restraining order on the HOA? Not the people per se, the entity itself. Or a cease and desist maybe? I don't know, but I'd totally do that if I were me. Yeah, I mean, if you're not in it and you're grandfathered in, that's what your legal contract says. HOA story time. Everything the association does causes damages. Posted by Busticode. Just a vent, but this stuff is getting old. Single family home, about 50 units. Seems this association finds the most incompetent vendors and unleashes them on the residents. First off, they hired a power washing company to clean siding. They left everyone's windows spotted and the overspray affected car finishes. Most homes are two stories and we can't clean our windows. They even hired an irrigation company to repair broken underground feeder pipes. They cut my underground cable TV and internet cable when digging up the yard. And now, a landscaping company is ripping out all the plants and rocks around every home, doing a halfway butt job and just found out that one of the workers deliberately cut a cable on my property going into my house. Found out the total cost of that project was over 250 grand. Several of us have mice problems. The HOA document states that the HOA is 100% responsible and owns all outside walls. I asked the HOA to remedy our mice problems, and nope, not their responsibility. Well, how else are the mice getting in if not through their walls? 
So we asked the management company to follow bylaws and post date, time, and place of each meeting in accordance with the bylaws. <laughs> no. We even asked the management company to post the minutes of past monthly meetings in accordance with the bylaws. Blown off and never posted. We sent in the request for approval to replace a sliding door. We have a sign-off form for that. And after much chatter among the HOA board, I get an email saying only approved. The door company refused to accept that and said that we won't install the door until they see that the request was signed off officially. In a few days, we're going to have our dryer vents blown out, but really in as they're doing it from the outside. No opt out, so I guess I'll just have lint blown into my dryer. My neighbor has had to purchase asphalt on his own and repair a huge pothole on HOA owned road as the management company did nothing about it for three, three whole years. I'm just, I'm just really beginning to hate it here and dealing with all these stupid issues. I once was helpful around here, fixing children's playground equipment for free, doing small jobs for the association so they didn't need to pay huge fees for tiny projects. <laughs> no more of that. Do you agree with this idea to get some lawyers? Not posting meetings, agendas, or minutes are probably just a violation of law, not just bylaws depending on your state. Throwing a couple hundred dollars at a lawyer to write a letter informing them of the laws that are breaking might convince them to get their act together, or at least leave the job to someone who will. The lawyer can mention the other issues where the HOA is breaching their duty as well. It's somewhat counterproductive to sue your HOA since you'll end up paying whether you win or lose, but the threat of a lawsuit can be effective. How would you handle this one? Karen declares war on my parents for cutting a tree down on their own property. Posted by EAY 7712. I, a 25 male, have been living away from home ever since graduating from college. My parents both retired recently, and last summer, they decided to use some of the money that they'd saved up to finally build their dream retirement home in New Orleans, where they've been living for the past 10 years. I come from a very tight-knit family, so I still talk to my parents every week, and they were so excited when they said they'd already picked out the location where they wanted the house built. It was an empty lot in a nice neighborhood where a house had been demolished not long before due to age, and the previous owner, who was pretty wealthy and owned numerous properties around the city, had decided that the lot was worth more without the house on it. Anyway, my parents snapped it up as soon as it came on the market, but not long after construction began, they realized that they were building their dream house right next door to the lair of a wild Karen. The trouble started when my parents had to cut down a large oak tree that sat in front of the lot. It was a real beauty too, one of those big southern live oaks, and although they didn't want to, they knew they had to remove it because it was in the way. No one likes to cut down a big beautiful tree, and believe me, if there was a way to avoid doing it without impeding the construction, my parents would have taken it. So they called a tree removal service, and the tree was soon gone. Well, a few days after the tree had been cut down, my dad was on the property talking to some of the construction guys and making sure that everything was going smoothly. He was going back to his car when he saw a woman in her late 50s walk out of the house next door and head to the mailbox. My dad, let's call him John, is a pretty chill and laid back guy who likes to be on good terms with everyone, so he walked over and introduced himself. Hi, he said, holding out his hand. My name's John, and my wife and I are going to be your neighbors once our house is finished. I just wanted to come over and say hi and introduce myself. It's nice to meet you. What's your name? Karen glanced at the extended hand and then looked up at my dad and glared at him. My name is none of your business, she snapped. I'm not going to shake your hand because of COVID, and even if there uh, was no COVID, I still wouldn't shake your hand because you people ruined my life when you cut down my tree. I still can't believe how selfish you are. You should both be ashamed of yourselves. My dad was taken aback by this and pointed out that Karen already had a nice big oak tree in her backyard, but Karen ignored him and stalked back inside her house. She never explained why she thought that she was the owner of that tree that had been cut down, not once, and whenever my parents asked about it, she refused to answer. I guess it's just one of those things that we'll never know, like what really happened to the lost Roanoke colony or the fate of D.B. Cooper. My parents met some of their other neighbors later that day, including a nice elderly couple who lived in the other house next door to Karen's, 
And when my dad told them what had happened, the neighbors said that Karen was like that to everyone, and no one in the neighborhood liked her. They also said that Karen had been nasty to them for a long time, and that they were in the process of selling their house because they couldn't stand living next door to her anymore. Karen soon began living up to her reputation. For months, whenever my parents would visit the house to see how the construction was coming along, she'd find something to complain about or confront them about. One time, she said that construction workers were being too loud and threatened to call the police, even though it was the middle of the day. Another time, she said that the construction company was using illegal immigrants as cheap labor and threatened to call ICE and have the whole project shut down. My dad mentioned this to the owner of the company, and the owner sent Karen a formal letter threatening a lawsuit if she tried. I don't know if there were any actual grounds for a lawsuit, but the threat must have worked because ICE never showed up. Oh, and then there was a time that she tried to have my parents' car towed for illegal parking when they parked by the curb of their still unfinished house. The first my parents knew about this was when the tow truck showed up, but the driver took one look at where my parents' car was parked and told Karen that he'd send her a bill for wasting his time if she called him again. I could go on. I mean, Karen did everything she could think of to try and interfere. She was absolutely relentless in her crusade to avenge a tree that she never even owned. Happily, the house was completed despite her best efforts, and my parents finally moved in not long after the holidays. My mom told me later that she caught Karen watching them bitterly from her window as they were taking some of their boxes inside. She was concerned that Karen might keep going and try something else, but I guess Karen was too busy wallowing in self-pity over her failure or something because things were actually quiet for a while. But a few weeks ago, things changed. New Orleans has had some really bad weather lately due to the winter storms that are battering much of the southern U.S. right now. And one night, one of those storms was so powerful that it knocked over the tree in Karen's backyard. It missed falling onto her house, but it didn't miss falling onto her shiny new Jaguar and crushing it like a beer can. According to my folks, Karen didn't discover what happened until the following morning. When she came outside and saw the pile of scrap metal that used to be her car, she threw back her head and let out a primal scream like something out of The Exorcist. She had to pay a tree removal service to get rid of the tree, and then she had to pay for a tow truck to get rid of the car too. And then she had to get a rental car too. Karen put up her property for sale and moved out not long afterward. Everyone in the neighborhood was so glad to see her go, and my parents enjoyed watching her drive off into the sunset from the front porch of their amazing new house. Now, Karen did not sell her house right away. She put it on the market and moved out of it as soon as she could. I don't know where she is now, but I'm guessing that she's staying somewhere else while she waits for someone to buy the property. I don't know if anyone's bought it yet, but since there's a pandemic going on, <laughs> I think she'll be waiting for some time. Karen yells at the security guard for doing her job, posted by Daddy Dorian Art. Oh, my mother is well known to be a Karen, even joking about it herself sometimes. She's usually really sweet, but when it comes to staff or workers, her Karen side comes out full force. I have many stories about her antics. So she is labeled here as a Karen, since she wears the name proudly. Me and my partner are moving out of our house to a new town. So last week, I moved back home with my parents for a few days to clean out my old storage room while my partner went down to the new town for his first day of school. My dad had a seizure the first day that I moved home, so my mom, Karen, asked me to help her with some general shopping while my grandmother watched my four siblings and took care of my dad. I drove us around town and to a few stores, eventually ending up at a Kmart. Think Walmart for us Kiwis, but no food, only general items. She wanted to get some workout gear, so we go in, we do our shopping, and we head to the checkouts. Here's where things get going. She grabbed the receipt and I grabbed the items, getting ready to walk out of the store. There had been lots of thefts recently due to the economic climate of my country at the moment, so security will quickly glance at your receipt, see the number of items that you have, and let you out. 
usually they don't do this to everyone, just shady people, which has gotten the company in hot water because of racism and discrimination. So the company now makes it an effort to check all receipts, which I'm fine with. As we walk out, my mother makes it past the security scanners before the young lady working as a security guard asks to see the receipt. Big mistake. My mother immediately screws her face up and makes more than a few scoffing sounds before exclaiming loudly, Excuse me? Do I look like someone who would shoplift? At this point, everyone at the Teals is looking over and I feel like melting into a puddle to get away as I have social anxiety. The poor lady puts her hands up in an, oh no, Karen on the loose gesture and politely explains that we need to check everyone's receipts so we aren't discriminating. Mother Karen puffs up and screws her face up more. But do I look like a shoplifter? All my clothes are labeled, all expensive brands. She then scoffs again, winding up for a whole tirade waving the little paper that would save me from embarrassment all around, all while flapping her lips like a shocked fish. She is slowly turning into a lovely shade of tomato red and looks like she's going to burst. Realizing things are going to get much, much worse, I finally pick myself up out of my mental puddle, grab the receipt from her claws, and show the security guard who's still attempting to placate the raging she-beast. I hand it over politely saying, here have a look, is this okay? While gazing longingly at those sliding doors, as I know, salvation from the dirty looks hitting the back of my head is only a few steps away. The poor security guard waves me through, and I grab my mother beast's shoulder to push her out. She relents, moving through and muttering about rights and managers, and not doing her job, stamping her feet like a toddler. I look over my shoulder as we walk out and give the security lady, who looked like she had just been slapped, a little smile and mouthed apology. The last words I hear before the doors to salvation slid shut was the security guard commenting in a small voice, I only needed to see the receipt, it's my job. I felt horrified. Relief flooded me as I realized that it was over, embarrassment burning at my cheeks as I shepherded the Karen to the car. All while she's still going on about how outrageous this was and how she feels disgusting and like a vagrant, all because she was asked to show her receipt. Thinking this was over, I hopped in the front seat, hands shaking and eyes tearing up. But no, the Karen turns to me, scrunched up her face, and made one more remark. This only happened because you look homeless. Wear a dress next time. Ah, <sighs> thanks, Mom. Thanks. Military Revenge Story, posted by Von Scranhammer. This was back in 2013 when I was based in Holland, the British Marine, for context. I had been married to my wife for a little over 18 months when I deployed to Afghanistan. My wife had gotten a job in the British delegation on base and got to know pretty much every Brit and their husband and wife. One day, we were directly targeted by a vehicle-borne IED. Now, while it wasn't uncommon for there to be a threat to coalition forces in general, being directly targeted felt more personal for obvious reasons. That was also the day I found out about an RAF guy back in Holland had tried it on with my wife. I found him on Facebook and, still feeling rather raw about Terry trying to blow me up, I messaged him words to the effect of, if you go near Mrs. Von Scranhammer again, I will put glass in your throat the next time I see you. The next day, one of my bosses, who was also RAF, messaged me on Facebook to say that this guy had been over to his office and basically tattled on me. He gave me a friendly warning and heads up that this guy could have gone to the MPs, military police, and reported me. I have no idea what would have happened, but I acknowledged the warning and said it won't happen again. My boss had my back and actually told him to wind his neck. Fast forward to when I got back from Afghan. A few days had passed and I was starting to settle into a quote normal life again. 
My wife brought it up, after explaining that she didn't mention it at the time due to my reaction the first time, that an army sergeant major had tried to message her via Facebook. He told her that she was beautiful and wanted her number. She promptly blocked him. I was ticked off to say the least, but I understand why she kept it until I was back on home soil. The next day, I went into our department and spoke to my other boss, an army captain, and I told him what had happened and he said, leave it with me. He basically had a chat with him and nothing came of it. I felt deflated and even more ticked off. That was until our senior military officer came into our department. He welcomed me back and asked how my tour was. Still ticked off, I said, well, it was good, sir, with the exception of Sergeant Major d trying to get round my wife. He was, understandably, a little taken aback. About an hour or so later, he emailed me saying that he feels the need to do something official about this. Something I had forgotten was that the Colonel and Sergeant Major belonged to the same regiment, so having one of his own behave like this had clearly gripped him. I told him the full story and provided screenshots of what Sergeant Major d had said to Miss Von Scranhammer. For this to go official, my wife had to provide a statement. Unfortunately, Miss Von Scranhammer is very non-confrontational and said that she didn't want this to continue. I respected her wishes of not wanting to provide a statement, but hatched a plan that would be three years in the making. The timing is important. I emailed the colonel and said that Miss Von Scranhammer has declined. However, I felt the need for some formal recognition, so I asked that Sergeant Major d write a letter of an apology addressed to both my wife and I, which is to be signed and dated. This was granted and I received the letter two days later. It said, Lance Corporal and Miss Von Scranhammer, I am writing this letter to you both to apologize for the torment and the anxiety that you both must have felt from my messages that you'd received from my Facebook account. To Mrs. Von Scranhammer, Nobody should ever be in a situation where they worry about going to work because of who may come through the door, especially so when they have the added stress of a partner being operationally deployed at the time. The anguish that you must have felt at this time is immeasurable, and for this, I apologize. To Lance Corporal Von Scranhammer, Being operationally deployed is stressful enough without the added stress and worry about family back home. Support from home and loved ones is what carries many people through tough times while on tour. For any undue angst I caused, I apologize. I regret any hurt and anguish caused by this issue and apologize wholeheartedly and unreservedly to you both. Signed, Sergeant Major d -bag. I now waited. I saw out the rest of my time in Holland, moved back to the UK to my new base, and waited some more. Almost three years after I received the apology letter, I looked up Sergeant Major d wife on Facebook. I had known the whole time we were out there that he was married and his wife lived back in the UK and he has routinely tried to cheat on her. I sent her the same screenshot which I had sent to the Colonel. I also, before leaving Holland, printed off the emails between the Colonel and myself where I requested the apology letter, I blanked out the Colonel's details, and sent the pictures of that. And then, lastly, I sent a picture of the apology letter, signed and dated by her husband admitting what he had done. Once I saw she had read it, I blocked her, blocked Sergeant Major d -bag and all his friends who had also been out in Holland at the same time. Why three years? I remember him saying, before he turned into a d -bag and tried it on with my wife, that he only had three years left to serve. If my timing was correct, he was months away for completing his 22 years and receiving a very nice pension. If his wife decided to go ahead with divorce, she would take half of said pension, which would essentially screw him over for the rest of his life. Ooh, man, that was nasty. It started off kind of chill, like, okay, he's going to get some decent pro revenge, and then by the end, he just drops the freaking hammer. Oh my god goodness I am taken aback and surprised by this resolution, are you? It's literally insane. Force me to deploy, I'll destroy your career, posted by Sheba was talking. Let's go back a few years. I was a combat engineer platoon sergeant. We had recently gotten a new company commander who thought his crap didn't stink. My first interaction with him was when I got back from running at M240B range where I was told that he wanted to speak to all leadership immediately in the conference room. 
Well, it took three hours for him to arrive, and despite First Sergeant calling many times, he insisted we stay. The entire meeting was him bragging about himself and saying that he was trying to get the company slotted for a deployment to the Middle East, as well as how excited he was to go. I spoke up and basically said he's a dummy, but with more words, which ended the meeting and got me a stern talking to in thinly veiled threats. This captain had been in for 15 years and never once been deployed. That takes effort and a lot of figurative sucking up. He only wanted to go now because he was up for major. It turned out Brigade had a mission and asked for volunteers. Captain Dummy volunteered me to go despite knowing I had gotten married a week earlier. I made it very clear that I did not want to go to the higher ups. I was told it was between myself and the captain. Well, a month out, my sister-in-law took herself from this world immediately after she miscarried at 33 weeks, found them both in the basement of their house. Well, Captain Dummy didn't care. No leave, and I was still to leave about a week after the funeral. Screw him. I walked in to talk to the command sergeant major and was immediately dropped from the deployment. But the captain was so far up the battalion commander's butt that nothing happened to him. After about eight months later, Captain Dummy got his wish. Headquarters platoon and one other was slotted to deploy. Of course, because I had the most combat experience and most deployments in the platoon, he naturally decided that's why my platoon should go. Now, in order to deploy, you first have to go to a month-long field exercise where you're graded on performance. This generally applies to the higher levels of leadership. By this time, I was just ticked. So, I got my squad leaders together and improvised a few missions. First, everyone was to follow the CPT's instructions as literally as possible, the captain, no matter how dumb, and not to give any advice. This led us to getting absolutely destroyed in training, which was glorious. Secondly, and most importantly, was the psychological aspect. So, this dummy commander would go to bed nightly at 2100 hours, no matter what. In the deserts of California, you can find all sorts of creepy crawlies to slip in a sleeping bag while sprinkling juice on his uniform. They'd also periodically hide some of his gear or render his rifle inoperable. So for days this went on, poor guy slept very little because I ensured his tent was set over top of a beehive. These bees hated any vibration and loved juice, and the dummy never realized why he was constantly getting stung. As we were to be falling under a new brigade, I had to go meet the higher ups, and wouldn't you know it, the colonel we were set to fall under, turned out, had been my first company commander who I got along great with. I pulled him aside and called up my squad leaders where we basically told him Captain Dummy was going to get somebody killed, pointed out his erratic behavior and overall poor performance. Needless to say, he was quickly relieved of command, a career killer, and sent back to work in an office where he belonged. As for myself and my platoon, I still didn't want to go, but the new company commander was my old platoon leader for my second deployment, plus I couldn't let my guys go without me. Turned out, it would be my last deployment as some injuries force you out of the military, but everyone came back alive. Now what can make this pro revenge even crazier other than completely dismantling this guy's career? What if he'd been allergic to bees? Seriously, like you have him over top of a beehive, they love the juice, they're just going bzz, 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 and just stinging him to death, and, and he's allergic to him maybe. I don't know, if he was, that would be a clear, that'd be a nuclear explosive revenge. But OP, you did what you wanted to do, it was brutal, and you got the job done, even though you still ended up having to go. What do you think? Crappy bosses mess around and find out. Posted by Onaplan. I had a job working warehouse and delivery for a store. The entire corporate structure was built on treating the people below you like crap, and that was passed down through every level. Managers would just bark orders and chew you out for any reason they could think of. They paid about 25 cents over minimum wage and the bosses drove BMWs and Mercedes. The big boss lived in an $8 million house. Our store was the freight hub for four others in this little chain, so we got to know the drivers from the other stores well, as they were always coming to load freight or to drop stuff off. One day, we're sitting with two drivers from another store and Buddy remarks that he and his partner are working over 60 hours a week. I say, well, he must be doing okay with all that overtime pay. 
He says they're not getting overtime, just paid a straight time rate. I ask him if he signed an averaging agreement, and he says no. He shows me his pay stub, and there it is. His partner comes back and confirms all this, and they've been doing it for months. He'd asked his manager about overtime and been told that straight pay was just the way it worked. I tell them that's illegal and urge them to take it to the labor relations. They're both reluctant to rock the boat, figuring they'll be fired. So I drop it. We, we never got any overtime. Our warehouse was busy, but our store wasn't. A couple months later, they're in again, and Buddy's partner tells us that he and his girlfriend are moving back east, and he's giving his notice. I tell him again to file a complaint, nothing to lose now, so he does. A few weeks go by, and when I come in one day, there are expensive boss cars parked all along the loading dock. My workmate says something big is going down. All the managers have been summoned and are inside with a bunch of people in suits. So we wander upstairs to see what's going on. The company bookkeeper had an office in our store and handled all the payroll. He was a Chinese immigrant, nice guy. The bosses were trying to pin this on him, saying he didn't speak English very well, which was true, and had obviously screwed everything up. Turns out, he was a pretty cagey guy. He knew what they told him to do was illegal and was able to produce all the records of him telling them that and of them telling him to basically just shut up and do it. He hands it all over and quits. I see Buddy with a new partner a few weeks later. He's got a pay stub for about 15 paychecks worth of earnings. Company got caught for all the overtime pay and a pretty substantial fine on top of that. Added bonus, the second in command had driven over a nail when he parked his silver BMW on the loading dock and had a flat when he came out of the store. He opened his trunk and called me over and said, change that for me. I told him, sorry, it's not my job and if I hurt myself, my compensation claim would be denied. As he went in to call a tow truck, I stood on the loading dock and gazed upon all the havoc I had wrought, and my heart was glad. The thing you gotta love about this is they're literally doing something illegal by not paying the working class people who need that money, who work their hardest every single day, and screwing them over all while they are being rich and having all the fun in the world, illegally. Way to go, OP. Woman steals nearly $100 worth of stuff less than one foot from my face and gets mad when I call her out. Posted by Dito. Hello everyone, this happened a few days ago at the smoke shop that I work at. I'm also an assistant manager there for context. I'm in the back office prepping a return when my manager points my attention to an obviously suspicious person in our store. She was wearing a coat three sizes too big, bright red, and it was not even that cold outside. I turn around and she's crouched down behind the back room door, looking at the vape clearance rack. The back room door is one of those swing doors and not a real one, so I just watched her as she did this, oblivious to my presence. When she walks away from the rack, I go to the counter. I see her take a value pack of vapes that we had left over for Christmas and walks to the other side of the store with it. We never saw that again. Then, she walks back to the register, presses her body against an end cap, and is very loudly opening one of the vapes. It came in this plastic wrap around it, so it was extremely loud, and she's less than a foot from my face, and I'm making eye contact basically with her as she does this. She walks back and forth a bit, and while she's walking around, all of the vapes are in full view in her giant coat pockets. I'm texting my manager who's in the office watching the cameras about everything. She finally comes to the register again to purchase a $2 CBD gummy when I call her out about the vapes in her pocket and if she intends to buy those too. She starts acting innocent until my manager comes out and notices them too and is questioning her about it. She tried to say that she bought them the day before to which my boss says, okay, great, we can check the inventory then to see if they were purchased. She starts getting defensive about it and screaming at my boss as we prove to her there is no way she bought those and all three of us, another co-worker being the third, saw her doing this in plain sight. She starts to walk away and we call the police as we cannot physically restrain or keep people there and we get the license plate of the car and tell the operators that. <laughs> well, they caught her. The dummy also had her friend drive there, and they were too oblivious to what his friend did when the cops called him. They tracked his license plate. 
I don't know what happened after that, but we are almost positive she went to jail or is going to because my manager requested to press charges. Oh, Karen. Now, you might not realize this, but stores, whenever you steal things from them, they wait until it's up to like a felony level before getting you. So you think you make it away, but you actually don't. In this case, they got Karen and they got her good. No ifs, ands, or cigarette butts about it. How dare you not help me when you're not on the clock? Posted by Bears and Butts. This happened Saturday afternoon, busiest day of the week. After taking my 30 minute lunch break, I came back inside the building, went up to the back room to drop off my bag, and then back to the register to clock back in and resume my shift. I'm not wearing a name tag or a walkie talkie, and our store's uniform is a red, blue, or green t-shirt and dark jeans. So while I am wearing the uniform, I wouldn't say it's easily identifiable. However, I must still be official looking because on my way back to the register, a woman asked if I work there. And being honest, I told her yes. However, I wasn't on the clock yet, and I could help her with whatever she needed as soon as I clocked in. She muttered something under her breath, but did follow me to the register, where two of my coworkers were who were actually on the clock. The register was being used, so it took me a second longer before I was able to clock in. Meanwhile, the woman spoke to my other coworker, who happened to be one of the managers, and just wanted to, quote, let her know how I refused to answer her question until I was on the clock. Love that customers now expect me to do my job, customer service, helping them find things in the store or answer any of their questions for free. Especially since that there were at least four other employees in the store who were all on the clock and available to help her. Maybe you like to do your work without being compensated for it, but I'm not going to lead you around the store without getting paid for it first. I mean, Karen, come on, it's basic math. On the clock, pay, help. Not on the clock, don't pay, don't help. But you probably don't get that now, do ya? 